Welcome to Smart Franchising with Fran Smart. I'm Dan Rowe, and I've masterminded the ascent of local favorites to global dominators. This isn't your usual get to know you chat. We're diving deep. We're revealing the raw truths about franchise wealth building. With over 30 years in the trenches, I'm spilling it all. If you have an appetite for unfiltered tales and the hidden blueprints of franchise prosperity, buckle up. We're diving in. So today's guest is a good friend, a family friend, former neighbor, Rick Fisher, who I met a million years ago in Old Town, Alexandria. He was successful as a software executive who was an early adopter of Five Guys and now a large multi-unit franchisee. And today we're going to hear his story. So first of all, Rick, thanks for joining. Oh, thank you, Dan. Hey, just to set the stage, how big is your company now? How many units do you have across what brands? So we're 37 units and growing. We have uh, 25 Popeyes and 12 Five Guys. Wow. How many of those do you own the property of? Seven. Good for you. Good for you. Do you wish you, you, do you, wish you started accumulating real estate earlier? Uh, yeah, there were times we did. I mean, I mean, real estate's kind of one of those funny things. It's a little bit of timing, so you could kind of get upside down real quick if you're not smart. But we were, we, we were in most cases, all the real estate we have is um, is we control. So we're the tenant and we're the landlord. Good for you. And, and the trajectory that you're on 10 years from now, do you see yourself with how many units if you keep going the way you're going? So we'd love to be, you know, double in size in, in that time frame. Um, and really it's depending upon, is it organic or is it going to involve M and a, um, M and a might change that. Um, we're not opposed to M and a, we're, we're also looking at, um, as, as you know, we've talked about this before, the idea of getting into other brands um, and diversification. Yeah. Hey, so so I touched on it. You were a software guy. You were not already in the restaurant business. So maybe give everybody your your story and how I how I talked you into this and how you got to where you are right now. <laughs> well, it really wasn't talking me into it. It was really your charm. Um, so. Uh, we, we, you and I became acquainted back, um, gosh, it seems a million years ago, like you said. Um, and I got involved in FranSmart very early on. And as a result of that exposure, got exposed to franchising and specifically Five Guys. So Five Guys to me was an interesting one because it was local. We were local to Alexandria. I mean, when we first started talking about it, you had just signed them up as a, as a, um, a franchisor representative from FranSmart. And they were in that very, very earth early growth phase. They maybe had eight or nine units open, 10 units open by the time I became a franchisee. And um, we felt comfortable with it, even though we were going to do it remotely. We were The plan was is we were going to build out in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. I had some friends and family down there. So I had a little bit of a connection down there. Um, but we were doing it remotely from our offices in Alexandria. And the idea was it was going to be an investment. And... Um, you know, build the five or six units and then flip it. Um, and um, so we, we went down that road and in 2008 timeframe, which where we had about four or five units open, uh, the market just crashed um, and it crashed in a lot of fronts. It was very scary. And fortunately, we had kept a fairly low debt ratio and been relatively conservative. Um, so we decided to lean in and instead of uh, folding our tent, move forward and build out within Another five years, we had 12 units open and um, <clears throat> we continued to kind of like go that go that route, because as we did that, the brand got more traction and um, really got uh, a lot of notoriety. And so we felt like we got a little bit lucky uh, with picking something that early on. Of course, it was with your with your advice and oversight. And so we, we had the benefit of that. We also had the benefit of knowing a little bit more about the brand because being local. So at that point. We started looking at other other concepts and saying, well, is this something we want to do longer term versus an investment? And um, so my wife and I talked about it. I remember calling you and asking you about it. I got referred into Popeyes through another um, franchisee of Five Guys that was already doing Popeyes and was telling me you know, great things about it, what the brand was doing. They were going through a renaissance revival sort of change, um, You know, had some success and some growth. So in 2014, we, we added them and then we began building out those. And then in 2018, when RBI, Restaurant Brands International, bought uh, Popeye's, um, Popeye's strategy changed and they went from wanting to do a lot of internal 
uh, running a lot of internal stores or company stores to refranchising and really paring down to just a handful. So we were the benefactor of that, and that's when we got the Greenville Spartanburg Asheville Anderson uh, DMA within a development agreement to build 30 locations. Um, so we're in, in, in the process of doing that. <clears throat> As I mentioned, we're up to 25 stores. And along the way, we've acquired some real estate, which has been great. We've also acquired that skill set of development, uh, knowledge around that, and sort of the expertise and internal knowledge. So at this point, we've got a development part of our company. We've got the operations portion of the company, and we have essentially a capital investments group within the company as well that we look for, you know, adjacent types of investments uh, to to complement everything we're doing. <clears throat> and it's been great. I mean, we've had our bumps like everybody else, um, and we but we think we're pretty well positioned with two strong brands and uh, you know a real good team. Good. And usually if I'm, if I'm giving someone advice, I say, if you're going to franchise a restaurant concept, franchise to restaurant people, people already with experience, <laughs> someone who's going to be building local so that they can keep an eye on it. And someone who's hundred percent focused on the business. You were neither of those, you right. were none, none of those, yet you're highly successful. So maybe like, what are some things that people can learn from you? How did you, cause you opened up in an entirely different state. It wasn't even like a different city. You were in a different state. Right. And, and the brand, nobody knew the brand down there. Right. So like this was roll back the clock to five guys. We in Alexandria knew it, but nobody, you know, nobody in Charlotte knew the brand. So like, how do you think that you were so successful with a brand in a different state passively running this? Cause you were still, you still kept your day job yep. um, and not able to focus a hundred percent of your time on it. Like what are some things people can learn from you? Well, um, you're right. No one knew the brand. Um, I remember distinctly when you and I first did a real estate tour, we went and we were meeting with some real estate folks and they're like, so what is five guys? Is it a tire center? I mean, it was hysterical because it was, they had no knowledge of it. Um, one of the things we decided early on, we just built it into our business plan, knowing that we were going to be remote. We built in the idea that we were going to hire a high level uh, remote operating partner. Um, the other thing we had the advantage of is we had some family in the, in the market, you know, a good portion of my family was down there, my siblings and so forth. And some of those were, uh, early investors with us. So we had a little bit of local coverage, but mostly it was about getting a, uh, not, not going on the cheap. I mean, when you hire that first employee, um, and they're going to be your operating partner, I think you've got to, you know, go long on that. And you've got to really kind of make sure that they're the right person. So we did a beauty pageant. We hired this guy who was really strong. And um, <clears throat> he not only had operations experience, he had local knowledge. He had local contacts. So he helped help us get off the ground with multi-unit pretty quickly. And he was also pretty, pretty adept in the financials. So it's a perfect operating partner. I think if we hadn't done that, our job would have been that, you know, so much more difficult because we were passive. You're right. We, we, we probably spent 10 hours a week on this at, at, in the early stages yeah. um, and, and really benefited from having that local horsepower. But you think about, I mean, the only reason to franchise is to get wealthy. Otherwise, why bother? Like why invest personal guarantees, the headache, the sleepless <clears throat> night, whatever. Why do it unless you really have a big upside? And so this is the kind of business, like I know a lot of Five Guys franchisees that opened one or two and just kind of rolled the money, just reinvested the profit and those compounded a really big business. Some of them have sold, like sold for life-changing amounts of money, a lot of money. And you have this ability in franchising to kind of get into a brand, start off with not a lot of money. And if you're smart and you invest properly and then you reinvest your profit into more stores, that can scale like, like now you're $50 million or whatever the heck you're at. And you potentially could double that, have a business you could sell for a fortune all because you hired the right quarterback. Like all right. because you had, cause you did it in a different state while you kept your day job. You had the safety of your day job. Um, but you did the whole thing because you got that, uh, that person, where do you find him by the way? We found him. He was uh, local to Charlotte. Um, he was working for um, at the time uh, Hooters. And he was sort of, they were going through some struggles at the time. And, you know, he loved the idea of uh, what we were going to do with five guys. He actually drove up to Northern Virginia, tested the product and said, this is awesome. And he loved the fact that it was very simple and that, you know, the ingredients were fresh and all that. So we got his buy-in really early. 
And we also tied them in. The other thing we did was we tied them in. We didn't give them equity, but we gave them a fair piece of the profits, um, Smart, which yeah. I thought was, yeah, I, I, I thought, and you, and you sort of have to do that when you bring in an operating partner, but we were generous. And, and I think um, that kind of lured him in too. Um, and he was really bought in. Um, so it wasn't easy to find him. We, we literally did a beauty pageant. We, we had all the people that I trusted to, to hire um, and give me advice on hiring for a, a, an operating partner. And we rented a hotel room and, you know, it was just one guy after the next. And, um, and, and this, this person stood, stood apart. So what, how about some of the things that you learned along the way, good and bad. And like, you know, like if you were given advice to <clears throat> your younger self, how could you have done this better in hindsight? Like, how could you, you know, like, like go ahead and. Yeah. Dive I, in. I, I, I think, you know, giving advice to my younger self or someone else starting out similar like us, I would, I would say, first of all, make sure you're properly capitalized. Uh, don't go into this thinking, you know, you'll see an item 19 in an FDD and you'll say, oh, wow, that's great. Don't pencil on that. Be, be, be conservative. Um, and I wish I was a little bit more conservative. However, the other thing that um, I, I give myself credit for and my team credit for back in the day was, is we didn't go along with, um, with uh, debt. debt. Um, it was very, very easy to get um, money back then. And, um, you know, you could get 125% funding at the time. And it was like, what? You're going to give me money to open up a restaurant and operating capital and all that? We were very conservative. I think we did a 50%. Yeah, now, now you have a debt service payment and you got personal guarantees against the default. Like that's smarter to go more <laughs> successful, smaller than than uh, than getting over your ski tips. I agree. Yeah. And I think the other thing I would tell myself if I had to do it all over again is I'd probably be a little bit more aggressive on the build strategy. Uh, we were very conservative. Um, and I think we passed on some pretty good sites. Um, when you find a good site, you got to go after it. Um, that's what we learned is, is that we went back a year or two later after saying, okay, we're ready for this site and it was gone. And cause good sites don't last long. Well, Hey, let's, let's talk about sites because to me in restaurants or retail, like frankly, your best marketing is your location, right? Like if you've got a great location, tens of thousands of cars going by, you put it in the middle of where people are going anyways, like that's, that's the thing. But like, you know, do you, any lessons or any advice for people thinking about saving a couple dollars going to the going a block away or going mid block instead of an end cap or anything like that? Well, you know, it depends on the brand. I think for us, for our brands, it's mostly about accessibility, egress, ingress, and making sure you can get to us and you can, you can get away from us without a whole lot of hassle. I think the public today is, is, you know, everything just moves faster. So they don't want to have to go left, right, turn, go to a stop sign, do a U-turn to get to you. They want to get right to you and get right away from you. Whether you're a five guys, you need to have that ability to drive up and, and um, you know, pick up the food because a lot of those folks will order ahead. Um, and we give them the nice little brown bag and they, they go on their way. Uh, for, for Popeyes, it's, it's about getting in and out of that drive-thru. And if that's a hassle for them, they're, that you're less likely. Now, exposure is good. You don't want to be three deep, right? Um, if you can get that hard corner at a light, wonderful. Um, there, 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 to me, is sort of a push-pull on that, depending on what market you're in. But I, I definitely would not go on the cheap with my sites. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, expensive so, or good – Good sites are not expensive. The only expensive site is a bad location. I mean, the good right. ones pay you and over over a long time, it's, it's just a much better investment. So how about some of the pitfalls? What about some of the learning pains? What about some of the things that you thought you knew that you didn't know? I mean, you obviously work through them, but like, what are some, what are some bumps and bruises you went through that someone else should try to avoid? Well, um, I, I, I really think you have to be, uh, you have to build out a good team, a good network. You can't do everything yourself. Right. And this is whether you're full time, like I eventually got to doing or you're you're part time. And what we probably didn't do early on enough or quick enough was we didn't develop a go to legal team. We didn't go develop a go to real estate team. We, we were we were like shopping ourselves with every deal. And that just takes more time and you get less loyalty from it. You probably don't create a business. I mean, now, fast forward today, we have a really mature network with our real estate, very good team on the legal side, 
really strong, even HR outsourcing we do, we, 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 we built up on that. So we're ready to go. We have 650 employees. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so, you know, it's no joke. And, and there's always an HR issue, right? So you got to have mobility and agility with stuff like that. I think what we made, the mistakes we made early on, we tried to do too much ourselves. And it ultimately seems like it's cheaper, but it's not. Um, so build out a partner network, understand all the functions you have to have to do a good business, whether it's restaurant or otherwise in franchising, and build out that network soon and build out those loyalties and essentially get your virtual team um, you know, uh, hardened pretty early on. We didn't do that. We were sort of like shopping ourselves all the time. And I think it, I think it probably cost us some time and money. Mm -hmm. And you guys, I mean, you didn't invest a whole lot of money in the beginning of this way back when you got in at a, when five guys was young, you didn't, you didn't have a ton of capital and you didn't invest a ton of capital, but you've parlayed it into this huge business. Like, do you think you could do that over again? And if you did do it over again, would you start out like knowing what you know now, would you start off with a plan to just keep compounding to like a 50 unit or $50 million business? Do you think you could do that today? I think you could. You have to. It depends on the brand, right? Um, You know, I've talked about this before. One of the great metrics to look at when you're looking at a brand is cash on cash return, right? Mm -hmm. So how much cash are you going to get for your cash that you're putting out, whether you're going to lever yourself a little bit or not? And then you do that math and based on the startup costs, you can really, really get yourself going pretty quickly. Um, Now, here's the problem. The problem is, is if if you go and do that, you know, um, Excel spreadsheet and it looks really good and you get all fired up about it. And then all of a sudden the profits aren't there. So one of the pieces of advice I'd give myself or anybody new doing this is take what you think you're going to make. Take what's in the item uh, item 19 and cut it by whatever, 20, 30 percent. And, and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to forget about things that are going to cost you money. Once you do that, then figure out your, your cash on cash return and your ability to lever forward and, and life will be good. And you can do something like that. Yeah. Yeah, you can. I mean, things never open when they're supposed to. They never cost what do you think. And they don't open quicker and they don't open up cheaper. So, yeah, they always take longer, cost more money. But yeah, I think, you know, like I see it with a bunch of different brands. There's plenty of brands that are merging today where the franchisees open up for not a lot of money. They execute the heck out of it and they just keep growing and growing and growing, especially now with like conversions. Like there's sadly with the economy and the headwinds in the industry, there's been some conversions and and, you know, that's sad, but it's also a good opportunity for uh, for some folks. Wasn't one of your original locations a conversion? I thought the one I thought I thought it was, but Um, Anyways, if so, so you got into another brand, let's say, and you mentioned that you might get into a third brand at some point, if you were going to get into another brand, what are some of the things that you would look for? Like knowing what you know now, I mean, you certainly have options. You don't want to make a mistake picking the wrong brand, but what are some things that you would look for in order for you to jump in? Yeah. Um, so some of it is just geography, right? We would want to make sure we do something that's reasonably adjacent to where we're already operating so we could leverage our operations team. Um, but that aside, if that was not an issue, I would say one of the things you look for is, you know, obviously unit economics. That's a big one. And surety of those unit economics. If someone has three stores and they're showing you their unit economics, you probably have to measure twice and cut once on that and really dig in. Uh, what's unique about those numbers. Now, if they have 300 units or 100 units and they've proved it out and the unit economics makes sense, um, then that starts to really, it's almost like a bond rating. You get it, that gets an A bond rating. The other guy might get a C bond rating, right? So I I look at that unit economics. The other thing I look at is the franchisor itself. Um, And I've learned this over the years about how important it is to have a a franchisor that has the, at least the mentality that we, we look for. We don't have all the answers, but we're looking for a franchisor that's going to be a good partner. The other thing we like about franchisors is some franchisors have a model where they simply say, look, we're in this as an investment. So everything, we're going to lever the heck out of this. We're going to run the smallest amount of locations we can, and we're going to open up 5,000 units. Others say, no, um, you know, they bet on themselves, basically. They say, wait a minute, you know, and Five Guys is one of them, by the way. They have 600 stores you know, less, just slight, slightly less than 2000 units. That's pretty impressive. So I look at that stuff because I know that a, a, a franchisor like that, every time they roll out a new, 
initiative, whether it's a piece of CapEx they got to spend or whatever it is, it impacts them more than it does me. Yeah. So when you said you're looking for a franchise or that's a real partner, what's a couple examples? Like what are some good and bad examples of that? So uh, real partners aren't, I mean, the, ultimately a franchisor is protecting their brand, right? That's what their job is. At the same time, they have this sort of potentially um, counterbalance of also helping me be profitable, right? Sometimes those things are at odds. So the good franchisors figure that out. They're not constantly, uh, there are some franchises out there that I think are more worried, so worried about brand compliance they forget about why we're doing this. We're doing it, as you said, to make money. And if your if your partner, if your franchisor partner is always reciting the rules and pulling out the franchise agreement and you know quoting things in the guidebook and all that stuff all too often, and not looking simply at how do we make you a better franchisee, how do we have you better represent the brand? Um, I think there's a balance there that that few do well. Um, but I, I'll tell you what is it goes back to if you run a lot of your own stores, you have sensibilities around the stuff I just mentioned. If you yeah. don't run a lot of your own stores, you're sort of looking at a spreadsheet and you're saying, hey, this would be great. Let's 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 add this twenty thousand dollar piece of equipment because it'll save us ten grand over the next two years. Well, that doesn't pencil. Um, and, it, and you wouldn't do it if you had 600 of your own units. You might do it if you had 25 of your own units and you were asking the other 2,500 to do it, yeah. right? So what's, what's the big difference? Like when you got into Five Guys, you got in early. I remember back in those days, you know, they were driving bread to the stores. Like they're the you know, most important thing of Five Guys is that bun. And they were driving those to the stores. That was early, early, early on. Yet you were still successful. But then you get into Popeyes that already had thousands of locations before you got there. What's a big difference or is there any advantage of going with a more mature brand versus, you know, you getting into an emerging brand? Like they're, they're both plus and minuses, but what are they to you? I think getting into a, a, a mature brand, you probably um, hedge your bets a little bit. You, you've got, you know, the history, the operating history, you've got a good franchisee base to, to, to question and talk to and get ref referrals on. Um, that's the positive. The negative is they're typically stayed in their approach and it takes a lot to move them. And depending on the way they're set up and they're structured, um, you know, the bad things don't go away quickly. When you get into an emerging brand and Five Guys was like this, I mean, you, you know them very well. They, they were very smart about the way they held firm on their quality and they held, they, they resisted um, and I'm glad they did in expansion of the menu. That to me is a characteristic, whether you're an emerging brand or you're a massive brand, you've, that is a really good characteristic um, because it, 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 tells a, it says a lot of things. It says to the franchisee, they're, they're confident in their, in their platform. Um, they don't have to keep tweaking it. Um, the other thing it says to the franchisee is, is that they're cognizant of the change and the impact it does to a franchisee. It's one thing if you have the muscle and the wherewithal and the capital and the excess um, resources to be able to deal with changes like that. But when you're a, even a 25 unit group like us, that's a big impact um, if, if, they, if they come at you with something like that. So I, I think there's pros and cons. I'm, I lean more towards mature brands now, um, however, there's some of these newer brands I look at and I'm like, wow, those numbers look great. I'm sort of quietly watching some of these newer brands and saying, wait a minute, um, there's some interesting stuff out there that kind of reminds me of, um, dare I say, Five Guys, right? Where they have this sort of mentality that looks very familiar. And the formula to me, it, the beauty of that formula is it's discipline. It's not, you know, high math. It's just discipline. So yeah, five, five guys was relentless about operations and about not changing the menu. And they kind of marched to their own drummer, but look, it's, I mean, it's globally successful brand. Like they figured it out and it is funny. Like you were there before anything was figured out. 
right? And mm -hmm. we were still successful. But now I, I hear what you're saying. The more mature brands also have access to capital, right? Like you go to a, all these lenders would rather lend further up the ladder than down at the emerging uh, ladder too. Sometimes do you find though, like, especially if you're looking to buy existing franchises, like if you were going to go buy 20 existing Popeyes, I, I sometimes see the lack of risk is priced into the deal. So they become way more expensive. Like I heard a couple Taco Bells trading for over 10 X, right? Yeah. And it's like, and you think about that restaurants need overhauls every seven or eight years. I mean, that's, you know, you can only amortize your equipment for so long for a reason. It's like, but like pe people, people paying huge multiples because they're more short or secure, I guess. But the downside is, I mean, you're never going to get your money out. You're not going to get near the return you could get as if you picked another five guys like the way you did. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It wasn't that long ago. And I'm talking probably five years ago. I sat down with a major bank and it was we were you know setting up our new uh, development line and lending platform. And at that time, they were even reticent to uh, give us much credibility around five guys. And, oh, wow. and it was really interesting to see. And it was a major bank. And um, now today, um, whatever concern they had is long past. Um, but, you know, you're absolutely right. The emerging brands, I remember very early on talking to a, a bank about five guys. And the only way we got funding for five guys was, number one, we had to do personals. That was probably the most important. But number two, the bank we went to, even though we were developing in the Carolinas, was local. So they knew five guys. So we were fortunate in that regard. Um, we've long since moved away from that relationship because it no longer suited our needs. But I, I think you're right. I think there is a balance there between like you buy into an emerging brand and it's cheap because they're, they're, they're uh, building in risk. The opposite is true if I buy into a Dunkin' or I buy into a Taco Bell. Or, those multiples are insane. So what you have to build out with those, if I'm going to go buy a Dunkin' group, I'm not going to do it based on the 20 units I'm buying. I'm going to do it based on the 20 units plus the 15 units that I can build out hmm. that is not largely priced into the deal. I would not buy 15 units by itself with no development rights. Smart. Okay. Hey, what? let's shift gears back to franchises. And you can just... Reflect on experiences you have with either brand or even other people that you know. But what's the big difference between successful franchisees and unsuccessful franchisees? Like I see all the time, every brand has the best and the worst, right? And so a lot of times the best guys are buying out the worst guys for a song and they're not doing anything other than operating. But what, what's your opinion of like why some franchisees struggle, why others succeed? One big one, and franchisors are going to love me for this, is, is they sway away from the franchisor systems. Um, the ones that fail typically are the ones that think they're smarter than the brand. And um, a number of folks that I've seen in, over the years in various brands that fail, largely fail because they went into a proven system and they thought they were smarter than that system. Um, so what we really push is, is, the brand has systems, they have very mature systems in some cases, follow those systems. They're not always convenient. They're not always, they don't always feel right, but they work. Um, the other thing I would say is, is if you're undercapitalized, um, you go into it again with that pricing for perfection mentality. Hey, I can borrow this. And, you know, the item 19 says I can make that. And, and then to your point, nothing ever happens on time. Um, you, you gotta, you gotta have a, you know, the sort of the conservative plan and the really conservative plan. Forget about the aggressive plan, throw yeah. that one out. Yeah. Um, and then, and then really the last piece is, is underestimating the value of getting a good team. Um, you cannot, if you're going to build a 20 unit, 30 unit, 50 unit, even 10 unit, um, uh, network, you can't do that alone. And you got to figure out who are, you know, how am I putting this football team together? And where am I going to go for legal, this, that, and the other thing? And then there's other parts of the structure is, as you figure out, well, where do I get my funding from? Don't assume, yeah, I'm just going to get 5 million from those guys. Don't assume that. You, you have to really measure twice, cut once. So I would give that advice to any new franchise group, whether, whether they were buying into a mature brand or an emerging brand. 
getting a loan always takes twice as long as you think anyways. And so, but I like, I like what you said about building the team. One of the things I'd add is don't do it on the cheap, right? People tend to pay people just what they need to pay people, right? You're paying them just enough to get them or to keep them so that they don't leave. The problem is they'll eventually leave, especially if they're bright, they're going to go on. And if you're trying to build something, I like, I like the idea of aligning your compensation, right? Like share the profit and say, Hey, if you help me build something that's so successful that we're able to between cash flow and lines of credit or whatever, expand, I'm going to give you a carry. I'm going to give you a piece of that, that you're actually going to own because God, the guy's making you 10 times more than, than, than you were going to make otherwise. And the beautiful part about owning a franchise or owning your own business is not actually doing it right. Like you're, you you have all these restaurants, you're not running shifts, you're not running. Right. Shifts. So yeah, no, I think that's uh, I think building the team's the biggest part. And I, that, that's one of those things I, I wish I learned at a younger age was to align where I wanted to go successfully like in terms of success with the people that I was trying to get to get me there, right? Like yeah. share, share the wealth and just, you know, have upside. Otherwise people are going to leave. So how about, how about, um, we're, we're, we only got a couple more things, but what are talk to franchisors, like talk to emerging franchisors, really, what should franchisors do to, to one, attract guys like you and two, help make sure that their franchisees want to keep opening and that they're and that they don't at some point leave and go start building another brand. Like what do franchisors need to do to be successful with their franchisees? Well, at the end of the day, it is show a model that makes money, right? And keep the eye on not just profit in the in the accounting sense or the P&L sense, but cash flow. Um, I have this conversation all the time with different franchisors and different franchisees about well, yeah, my net income looks great, but I had to spend $75,000 in CapEx that I had no idea that I was going to have to spend. Yeah, that's not on my P&L and it, my EBITDA is not impacted by that, but it's cash flow. So we are all in this for cash flow. It's a cash flow business. And, and essentially, if you talk to any of the big banks, they'll tell you what they're doing is they're giving you cash flow lending. So, um, you know, I would say to the franchisor, be aware of the fact that Yes, you can show great numbers on EBITDA and maybe um, even on things like profit or gross margin. But bear in mind, cash flow is very important. So be cognizant of things that impact cog cash flow. Um, yeah. That's, you know, the people side. Um, the other thing I would tell franchisors is don't wait on technology or on innovation that will help you become more efficient. The, there's a renaissance going on in all industries around things like artificial intelligence and use of automation, even robotics. Um, be aggressive with that and show that you're aggressive with that because the labor force is, if you talk to anybody who's running a restaurant now, I don't care if it's, you know, your fine dining all the way through your simple counter and truck, truck sales guys, everybody's having trouble with labor. Everybody's having trouble with labor. And there's a lot of reasons for that. So what we got to do is lean in as an industry towards automation. Doesn't mean we're, you know, uh, have a plan to get rid of all people, but we should have a plan to get rid of all mundane tasks or things that could otherwise be done through technology or automation or robotics. So I would say to franchisors, lean in on that. We're working with a couple of franchisors. Both of them have ideas around use of simple things like kiosks. You go into McDonald's nowadays, which I don't often do, but when I do. I almost always order through a kiosk mm -hmm. and the kiosk never forgets to ask me, do I want fries with that? <laughs> it, you know, do I want to plus it up with pancakes or do it? You know, I guess they can <laughs> see me in the mirror and say, boy, this guy's got a lot of extra muscle. So we might want to, might want to throw some extra calories at him. But those types of things, I think franchisors need to be cognizant of, because if you lean in over the next three or four years, you're going to see the labor market not get better. I think it gets worse. Um, for a lot of reasons. So we struggle with labor is one of our biggest challenges right now. You know, there's others, but that's the biggest challenge. Last piece with franchisors is set up a network where your franchise business consultant or your franchise business partner is not so levered that he or she only sees you once a year. Uh, hmm. It's not this way now, but when I first got involved with Popeyes, the, the, the guy that was in charge of our group had 200 other restaurants. And by definition, I'm going to see him once a year, right? 
Um, and and contrast that with five, now they're not that way today. They're much much better. But Five Guys is the model. Again, I, I pick on them for a lot of goodness. Um, the person that supports us, I think he's got forty restaurants, and we see him every other week. Yeah. And so I would say, don't go cheap on support, even as a newbie, count on support. And that support isn't just the day to day once you're open, it's new, new opening support. It's real estate selection. It's, you know, the advice that franchisors can give you, make sure that support system, at least there's a plan for it. Emerging folks, like when we started out with five guys, they had none of that, right? It was you and I chasing real estate. Yeah. Right. Um, but over time, they should build that into their plans. And I think whatever they can do, at the end of the day, the tip of the spear on all this is have a mind's eye on cash flow and getting cash to the bottom line as quick as possible. And it'll probably guide you to do the right thing. So you think about franchising, franchise as a franchisee, you're more successful the bigger you get, obviously. And, and franchisors, you're more successful if you have bigger franchisees. So you, in, you have 37 stores or whatever you have. It's better to have one person with 30-something stores than 30-something franchisees with one store each, right? And you think about it, if you, if you get a franchisee that's got, I don't know, 30 locations of a million-dollar concept, 30 million bucks, he's spending $3 million back to the mothership between royalties and marketing and rebates or whatever the heck it is, you know, $3 million. And you, you know, you're, you're going to have one person that sees you once a year. I mean, you know, for that much money, you should have someone in your business all the time. And the franchise consultants should actually be helping rich get more successful. There's a bunch spectrum of franchisees. Somebody's always figuring something out. Somebody, something's are always figuring out a better way to deal with some issue that we're going through share that info, like make, make the franchisees happy and successful and want to open up more stores. Like, you know, I see a lot of times you, these articles where someone signs up for 20 units, they stop building. They get, even though they signed up for it, they stop. In other cases, just like, you know, we have a couple of our brands right now where people sign up for territories and they double down and they buy more territory because they like what they're doing. All the money is in those kind of franchisees. So, yeah, I mean, any any uh, any other advice that you have for franchisors trying to trying to get it right with their franchisees? Let me know. Yeah, I I mean, the parting comment on that is is franchisors should put themselves in the shoes of the franchisee, and they're in it to make money, and so is the franchisee. The main thing I see franchisors do right, and I love it when they do this, is they protect their brand. That is, I love that, um, and they're violently almost like maniacal about protecting their brands. And the two brands we're in do that very, very well. Where it sets, where you set yourself apart though, is you, if you have the methodology to do that while keeping an eye on cash flow. Yep. And that, that really is the trick and it's not, it's not without its challenges, but um, you know, it, it, it can be done. I know it can be done because I'm working with at least one that does it that way. Good, well, last one for you. You think back about your career as a franchise and then a new franchisee is coming to you for some advice. Any, is there three things that you think you could have done better or any advice that would have made you avoid mistakes or get to where you are quicker? Anything like that? Anything a franchisee can learn from you? Well, build the team, right? If not build the team, have, have an idea what the team's going to look like and pay for it. Right. That's, that's number one. You know, you, you mentioned that too, is we can't, you can't do it alone, especially if you're not a restaurant person, right? If you're not a restaurant person, don't even think you know what you're doing. Hire somebody who knows what they're doing and pay for it and incentivize incentivize them correctly. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, and this is really in the category of new franchisees, right? Yeah. Um, so for new franchisees that have nothing, um, I would say, you know, when you build your plan out, be conservative. Um, and I've said that a couple of times, but I, I, I will tell you, um, there's far too many people I talk to, they send me their plan and I look at it and I'm like, I'm almost embarrassed to tell them. Yeah. Um, you're, you're not going to be, this is not what's going to happen. And you need to take everything and add, a, add six months on the time side and take everything on the profit side and subtract 20%. And then we'll have a conversation. Mm. Um, and then, and then the last thing is, is that you, you need to be, be prepared that it's hard work. Um, I didn't really realize how hard 
it was going to be. Now, like you said, I, I was tech before, so I had no business getting in the restaurant, mm -hmm. but it's very hard. It's not like, a you know, you want to think it's coin operated and it can be coin operated, but you really need to put the blood, sweat and tears in. And most of the blood, sweat and tears that comes from the franchisee is navigating that brand compliance piece along with the plan to build and be successful on the profit and cash flow side. And those are the two things that you really, I, I wake up every day worried about two things. One, am I brand compliant? Am I going to get some kind of, um, you know, complaint from the brand about not doing this, not doing that, or causing the brand risk? And the second thing I worry about is cash flow. That's what uh, most franchisees worry about. Yeah. And your, and your parting thought is owning a franchise is not an ATM machine, no matter what the broker says, right? That is probably true, except if it's you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you are great. This was great. I really appreciate it. I'm going to keep following your journey. We're going to have you on from time to time as you keep kicking ass. And, and uh, I really appreciate you being willing to let people learn from your, from your experience. So Happy much to do appreciated. It. talk to you soon. Thank you. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Smart Franchising with Fran Smart. I'm your host, Dan Rowe. If you enjoyed today's episode, this podcast is only going to get better. Please like, comment, and subscribe to hear more from the most successful franchisors and franchisees, and we'll see you next time.